Would you go ahead and hit the lights for me, Lydia? Thank you. Thank you, Judah team. The Lord is good. And I love how when uh, I know I'm going to be sharing something that is a little even different for me, but yet you begin to hear threads and themes of that being introduced throughout the morning, just giving you a signposts, yeah, fair warning, and uh, signposts that uh, we're on the right track because I don't know about you, but it just seems like we're in a time, certainly in our lives, where not everything is laid out so clearly. Anybody relate to that? They're, uh, it's kind of like the Mayan calendar. It only went to 2012. These poor Mayans have just been lost ever since. So I've been feeling like a Mayan lately, however a Mayan feels. Calendarless, yes, roadmapless. But that's by design. I mean, the Lord, um, we're in a time where, as the word was spoken earlier, don't get your eyes to the left or the right, and that's not talking just about politics. <laughs> I brought my own backup team today. Now look, we're on track to get out of here really early today. So I need you all to wake up, act like you're here, and I'm going to go through this as quickly as the Lord will allow me. I, I've got some, I, I tell you, I just, it's a weird moment in time. It is just a weird, I mean, you know, seriously, we all know this, right? We all get this. It's just a weird moment in time. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. It's a weird moment. It's, it's an interesting season. I'm going to share something today that uh, I have not shared anywhere, um, and bits and pieces of it have come out elsewhere, but the kind of the core topic, I, I've heard it a few times lately in passing. I, I've heard it, and the Lord's like highlighted it, uh, this, this phrase over and over, and you know, you have to go with what the Lord is saying. Um, it, you cannot... <clears throat> for those who are called to, and we're all ministers of reconciliation, when you're called to be a carrier of something or a dispenser of something, you can only give what you've been given, right? Amen. You can only articulate what you're hearing. Um, it's, it's never a good thing when somebody tries to present somebody else's material that hasn't become a personal revelation to them. Does that make sense? Even the, the best and brightest among us, you know, a, a mother, when she's nursing her baby, she eats solid food, but the body processes and breaks that down and turns that into a, 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 a food substance that is useful to the baby. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to get a baby to eat a piece of pizza unless you eat it first right you and the baby will pay for that one <laughs> so it's the same when we're hearing from the Lord and speaking what he's saying we have to process it first so I've been chewing on this for a while lately and uh, I have no idea how this is going to come out today but we're just going to dive right in If that isn't enough to keep you awake this morning, then, uh, yeah, and I will say this, if we get out as early as it looks like, you all aren't going to know what to do with yourselves. You are not going to have a clue what to do with your Sunday. You're going to have so much time. <laughs> Pizza. <laughs> Good one, Bill. <clears throat> I'm going to start off by reading a, a passage of Scripture. This is the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 10. 
And he's talking to his disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. We've all heard this. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. We've heard this. Go, behold, I'm sending you out like lambs in the middle of the wolves. And here's where he's giving them a little more practical advice of what this looks like as they're going out on this immediate uh, exploration of this uh, decree or mandate that he's giving them. He tells them specifically, carry no money belt, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. And whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And stay in that house. He goes on to tell them eating and drinking and provide uh, or uh, doing the labor because um, what a labor, the, the provision of a labor, the labor is worthy of that provision and it'll be provided by the person of peace in the house that you stay. I want to talk to us today around the theme, and I say theme because it's going to pop up throughout uh, the course of what I'm sharing about the person of peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up in the church world uh, in any circle that I've ever heard any kind of a systematic reference to the man of peace. Anybody else? Never heard it taught on. I, I, ever, occasionally I hear references, but I would never, I never really understood this concept or really even looked at it about if a person of peace is found. And just recently, I, it's like every time I would hear somebody say it, the Lord would put his finger on it and say, look at that, look at that, look at that. So when I went back and looked at it, I began to realize that this pattern <clears throat> or this concept that was introduced by Jesus to his disciples um, later became a principle that Paul used throughout his ministry. Everywhere he would go, he would wait until a person who was peaceful or uh, amicable to the gospel would present themselves and he would make an establishment of a relationship with that person or that group. Does that make sense? And in fact, over and over throughout uh, the book of Acts, you see Paul going into a place that he's never been and establishing a pattern. But before I jump into that, this is going to feel a little bit like Sunday school. Those of you who are old enough to remember Sunday school, where we're actually going to learn something historical and then watch how the Lord brings it into the now. Because I believe... And the reason why I feel like the Lord is having me share this today is as we are rapidly approaching the end of the age and even overlapping into the next age, think there are things that were there in the beginning and really have been there the whole time that are going to be very relevant to the day we're in as we see the age close. Does that make sense? I want to read a, a passage of scripture very quickly, and you'll see how this concept plays out. Acts chapter 10, it says, As Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. We're all familiar with this story. A centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. Now, we're all familiar with this story, and I'm not going to read the entire chapter that goes with that, but basically, Cornelius is a man who is currently outside of the covenant that uh, the people of God, who we would call the Jews, are a part of. He's a centurion. He's a Roman. He is what we would now call a Gentile, right? Everybody tracking with me? <clears throat> but he is a Gentile who has an element of God-fearing uh, 
characteristic that causes him to be aware of kingdom things without even trying. And we're going to use Cornelius as a template to describe what I believe the Lord wants us to become aware of, of what this man of peace looks like in the day that we're in, what it looked like historically as well as the day that we're in. And I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive, and I'm just going to encourage you, fasten your seatbelts, don't check out, don't go to sleep. Some of you will find this incredibly fascinating, at least Mary Frances and I, <laughs> and maybe a few other of you Sunday school addicts will find this history lesson fascinating. There's, there's so much in Scripture we don't understand because we have no historical context for it. In fact, until I did a deep dive into uh, Messianic th Jewish theology in a, a course that had me scratching my head going, what am I doing here, Lord? Um, I had no clue. I'd never heard any reference to the first 300 years of church history never heard it systematically taught I've never heard anybody reference it in any real way uh, about as far back as you would hear would be the early church fathers and that's four to five hundred years but in the first 300 years you don't hear anything about that in other words Jesus walks the earth in 33 AD and then there's about a 300 year period until Rome hijacks the Jewish messianic movement and creates the what we become known as the western church model and there's 300 years there that you don't hear anything about was that true yeah and so as i began to look at this the lord began to show some things to me that just were absolutely astounding in fact I had read the book of Acts, I don't know, numerous times, and there were these terms that would pop out like Hellenist, or Greek, or devout uh, person, or the things that made no sense to me because I was just thinking you're either Christian or you're a Jew, and it never even occurred to me that the first 300 years-ish of Christianity were mostly Jews. But then there was this other component that came into play, and I want to give us a little bit of a window into this. And I mean it's a little bit of a window. We could camp out here for months, but we're not going to do that today because I've already told you you're going to get out early. So I'm going to have to do this deep dive really quick, but you all are going to stay with me, right? In 333 B.C., B.C. means before Christ. So we're talking before Jesus walked the earth, 333 years ish, roughly. There's a man named Alexander the Great. How many remember Alexander the Great? And he had this propensity for domination. In other words, he saw everything not Greek as the enemy, and he set out to conquer the known world. And at an early age, he was very successful at that and one of the tactics he used which was later implemented by rome was he would conquer a people and then he would send in a delegation which we would refer to as what became known as apostolos how many have heard the story apostolos were the greek delegation of all things greek or hellenism hellenism is another word for greek or hellenization of a culture is where greek culture is infused or overlaid on the culture of the land that was conquered how many are with me still so you have alexander the great who thinks Hellenism is the way everybody should live, and he loves Greek culture so much, he sets up generals everywhere he goes, throughout where he conquers, and they have one mandate, and that is to make the people in the land taste like Greek. I don't know if they, uh, you know, did like black olives and feta cheese... But here's one thing they did do, and this is going to become very relevant. I promise you, if you really get a grasp of this, you'll go back and read the New Testament, and it'll be like a book you've never seen before. It will become more relevant. You'll understand the significance of Paul's ministry like never before, and I believe it will directly tie to the relevance of, 
of this man of peace concept at the end of the age why it matters see and I have to tell you right up front there's two very different worlds at play when you read the scripture in the New Testament you have the church at Jerusalem which is in proximity to the temple at Jerusalem and for those of us who didn't know which is probably the majority of us these are not the same two things the church in Jerusalem and the temple of Jerusalem are not the same thing at all the temple is the Jewish Orthodox structure of the law of Moses that's been handed down from generation to generation now all the Jews that are in the church of Jerusalem have been a part of the Jewish temple but the temple is the practice that's carried on since it was handed down by Moses everybody follow me so here's what happens a very interesting contrast when you get outside of Jerusalem you start having this thing pop up all throughout Judea and Samaria the, the area that we'll refer to geographically as the Levant which is what Alexander conquers in 333 and is the backdrop for this story it's called the diaspora that's what historically is referred to in other words the Jews that are throughout this land they're not in Jerusalem the diaspora re means literally dispersed or scattered so the Jewish population is scattered throughout this whole region and if you're not at the temple in Jerusalem you are in the diaspora and if you're in the diaspora the central hub of religion and culture for you is what who knows the synagogue now you hear the term synagogue and like me up until I had to do a, a, a study of things that I never wanted to you think church synagogue church it's like church but for Jews right well the synagogue was a very different thing the synagogue was actually an extension of the culture of the diaspora which had been Hellenized so you had Greeks and Jews both in the synagogue I, I know that doesn't make sense because in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem temple it's kind of a religious bubble and they're pretty much purists and Gentiles did not go in to the temple now they would be in the outer courts but they would not be beyond that Gentiles were not a part of the Jerusalem temple but when you got in the diaspora Gentiles and Jews mingled together in every part of society except for meals now meals are a big deal and it becomes a major part of the New Testament writing more than I can go into but a lot of what's being fought over between the Jerusalem elders and Paul trying to convert Gentiles into the faith of Yeshua has to do with food believe it or not because Jews have very strict dietary laws and eating is such an integral part of their social interaction they have no idea how to figure out how to mesh Gentile believers in Christ and Jewish now believers in Yeshua who are conformed to these strict dietary laws they it's like oil and water they cannot find a way together this is really what many scholars believe is at the core of Acts 15, the dispute that has to go back to Jerusalem, where Peter and Paul go back and they talk about uh, the laws that cannot be put on Gentiles, and they come down with this decree of three things that they're, they're to adhere to, and I'm not going to go into that because that's another month of a deep dive, but the major issue at stake there is believed to be, how do we eat together? Crazy. Why does that matter because outside of Jerusalem see like Tulsa we live in a religious bubble here in Tulsa but you get outside of Tulsa 
Like I, I have a friend who's in New York. He's like, you know, I never, I never sat around and argued with people over whether they uh, worshipped on Saturday, Sunday, had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, knew, ha- agreed on how many angels danced on the head of a pin. You know, all these wonderful things we divide ourselves over in Tulsa. He said, I'm from New York, and if you you ran into somebody else that believed in Jesus. You were like instant friends, right? It didn't matter what secondary belief system you had. And that's kind of the way it was in some regard back in the day. Now stick with me because I know this feels completely disconnected. It's going to connect eventually. So... In the synagogue, you had Jews and Greeks. Now, synagogue is mostly a place of worship for Jews because they don't have proximity to the temple. And many Jews, even though they were commanded to go back once a year, some of them, if they could make it back once in their lifetime, that was the most they would be able to do, to make it to the trip to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. But in the synagogue, they did all these. But because they're intermingled with uh, Gentiles, they have to have a mechanism for Gentiles to come in. Now, this is mind-boggling if you think about it in like through the context of the book of Acts. As soon as I say this, it's going to start triggering bells. If you wanted to worship Yahweh, now here's the thing you got to understand about your average Greek Hellenists. They are good polytheists, which means they just have many gods. So worshiping Yahweh fits right in. They don't care. If it means I can interact with you socially and economically, then I'll worship your God. So I'll come hang out in the synagogue and take on the custom of of Judaism as a proselyte. How many have heard the word proselyte before? Remember Jesus said you'll travel long and far to create a proselyte in your own image you won't go in you won't let him go in anyway he said a lot of things about how the pharisees would try to create followers after themselves well that's what this proselyte concept was so i could be a proselyte gentile and interact with jews at the synagogue it doesn't mean we're eating meals together necessarily but we're in the same social functioning so to speak in the synagogue because we're away from Jerusalem the religious bubble where everything is pure and Jews and Gentiles don't mix but in the diaspora this is not so in fact many Jews would go through the citizenship process to become Roman citizens which was a hundred percent through the Greek institutions that were created everywhere they went where Greeks were educated in all things Greek culture and Jews participated in this in the diaspora. So you have a meshing together of Jews and Greeks. Now why is that important? Because all throughout scripture when we read places where it talks about God-fearing Gentiles or people who have Uh, some element of an empathy towards uh, you'll you'll see the word it'll say devout or god-fearing or proselyte or or hellenist or hell oftentimes these are referring to gentiles who are not jews by birth but have somehow taken up an affinity towards jews and judaism In fact, some of them would go so far as to fully convert, which means they did walk away from their Helen or from their uh, polytheism. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. They would walk away from their polytheism to devote themselves to the worship of Yahweh, the one God Yahweh. These were the most radical, and they're often called zealots. Now, not the zealots like that go along with. Judas that betrayed Jesus necessarily but they were called zealots in the general sense because how many of you known somebody who's converted if I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes how many you know 
anybody who's ever gotten saved and suddenly they're so fanatical you can't stand to be around them i'm not talking about full of the zeal of the lord and they love jesus i'm talking about just becoming a religious nut you know it's like everything becomes about the list of rules and regulations and they just become intolerable well this is what these gentile jewish converts become they're almost more radical than some of the jews and there's a power play at place in the synagogue now stay with me because this feels like i'm going way off in left field there's a power play at place where the jews have power or influence over these gentile converts proselytes who become zealous for yahweh and paul who it's worth mentioning right here who has grown up in the diaspora he says i'm paul of saul of tarsus right tarsus is in pagan ephesus that is his background so paul is thoroughly familiar with the diaspora synagogue and the dynamics that go on there which is interesting why the lord chose him as the apostle to the gentiles why everywhere paul goes it's all throughout scripture in fact i just want to give you some quick references real quick everywhere he goes his message he first goes to acts 13 14 17 and 19 he's disputing against the hellenists we've already explained what those are and he's found himself in a synagogue what appealing to whoever's listening it's some jews but it's as many greeks or gentiles and the message is this are you ready for this gentiles you don't have to become jewish to worship yahweh see paul writes about this in romans he says is god the god of the jews only or of gentiles also because if he's the god of jews only then everybody has to become a jew to worship god does that make sense but if he's the god of gentiles only then you can accept christ and be born again and worship the god of the jews without becoming jewish everybody with me well this is disrupting the power structure in the local synagogues throughout the diaspora because the jewish leadership has a really good thing going think about it because all these gentiles who want to worship yahweh have to fall within their system to become proselytes don't shake your head too hard don't don't find a personal current day application and this explains why everywhere paul goes from the time his ministry is launched until he is carted off to rome as a prisoner why these jews zealots and hellenists show up everywhere he goes see they were okay with a jesus that fit in with the system as it was but they were not okay with a jesus that created a different pathway to citizenship <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it. Now, how is this relevant to this man of peace? The man of peace concept, you see Paul picking up and using everywhere he goes. The Lord would identify somebody. He would lock into them somebody unknown and they would become like the staging point or the jumping off point in that region or that city or that synagogue see the church of jerusalem 
is running simultaneously uh, as this is being carried out. And it says in Acts chapter, uh, it's actually in Acts chapter 11, and I'm not going to pull it up and read it, but well, I might pull it up and read some of it. A few chapters before when Stephen is stoned, it says Paul is, or Saul is holding the coats of the men who are stoning him. And the next chapter begins with Saul consented to the stoning of Stephen. And it goes on to talking about the persecution of the Jews at the church of Jerusalem. I'm, not talking, about the, I'm talking about the church of Jerusalem. And how they begin to scatter. And as they scattered, they went... And they began, it says, some of them were telling the Jews of the resurrection, but then some began telling Gentiles. Now, it's interesting because we read that and, you know, it just sounds like they were just doing some good Jewish street witnessing on the way out. What this is actually saying is they're interacting with this cultural phenom that had taken place in the diaspora where Jews and Gentiles actually interact together around many aspects, education, commerce. Um, commerce was a very, all the th things they did in buying and selling and trading. It was only in the religious aspect that they had a more of a hard line, but even that, as we already talked about, could be blurred if the Gentile convert was willing, to, or the Gentile was willing to be a convert and become a proselyte, then they could socially be accepted fully uh, into the Jewish synagogue. But it was through this persecution that took place after Stephen's stoning that the Jews, it says, they were all scattered except for the apostles from Jerusalem. So you have the church in Jerusalem, which basically is just an apostolic company left, a group of apostles. The rest of the church is scattered, and there begins to be a relocating or a reconfiguring around this place called Antioch. And Antioch becomes the new hub for the working of the Holy Spirit. And this time, while it involves the Jews, it is largely uh, including or incorporating the new Gentile converts that are coming in. In fact, it says that Barnabas uh, went back and reported to the church in Jerusalem what was going on, but then he went and found Saul or Paul, who had already had his Damascus Road experience, and brought him back to Antioch, and they stayed there a year discipling the new converts at Antioch and establishing the church there. And it was from the church in Antioch that Paul's world mission was launched. It wasn't from the Jerusalem church. Well, why is that significant? For a couple of reasons. Paul was the Gentile to the, or the, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Thank you. Too much Greek running through my head. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, but it's also significant because the Lord was establishing the Jerusalem church never went away, but the Jerusalem church was not the expression of the Gentile mission. The Antioch church became that. How many are following what I'm saying? See, the Gentile mission was launched through the Antioch church and the what we call the apostolic uh, mandate which was really just an extension of the commission Jesus gave his disciples when he ascended, Paul takes that to another level by saying, okay, Peter is called to the Jews, I am called to the Gentiles, and he begins his mission of basically carrying out the extension of the, or his version, or his uh, portion of the Great Commission to the Gentiles. Paul has a slightly different method when he goes to the Gentiles. And his method looks like this. If Paul is being persecuted by Jews everywhere he goes, why does he keep showing up and going to the Gentile? It's because the Lord 
some, I don't know if he got it by revelation, if he had heard the teachings of Jesus. You know, it's probably a combination of all the above, but whatever it is, he has a revelation that everywhere he goes in the Gentile world, his first stop is to, if, just read it all through the book of Acts, his first stop is in the local synagogue wherever they go. And when he's rejected there, or if he's rejected there, or if nobody accepts it, then he moves into the open marketplace. But by at large, it takes place in the synagogue. Why is that significant? Because there is a man of peace or a person of peace who is a recipient to the message that has not yet been identified. Now I'm talking from heaven's perspective. Why is this important to us? I believe there's been enough shaking in the American church that many have gotten free from this enclosed bubble, religious bubble mentality like that existed in the Jerusalem temple. Where we can interact with people who have not yet known Christ, but yet there's something in their heart that's open to the God of the universe. How many understand what I'm saying? Listen, I find myself surrounded by people that have a goodness to the core who don't openly profess Christ that I know of. You could tell they've had some exposure somewhere, but they are so... It's like they're just half a step. I mean, if the ground shook, they're going to fall in, right? They are so close and they don't even know. I mean, some of these people, I'm just going to say this. I would hook up with them before some Christians I know. Because they demonstrate the kingdom. I work with guys, you know, I'm in the, for those of you who don't know, I'm in the trucking space. I work with guys and there's one in particular that, you know, his language wouldn't fly in most churches on Sunday. But this guy would bend over backwards for anybody, for anything. I mean, he would take the shirt off his back. He is one of the most helpful. In fact, he has single-handedly helped me get into the space that I'm working in now. He's connected with, with almost every significant contact I've made, even equipment, the whole nine yards, and, and it, he, he wants nothing for it. Just helping somebody out. Listen, the Lord wants to make us aware that there are people that he's using. I heard somebody reference this recently. They were, they were asking the Lord, Lord, how do you use unbelievers in the life of believers so often? And the response he got really shook him. And he said, it's so they have a reward when they step into eternity. Think about that. So that they have a reward. I mean, how many of you know, and listen, 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 don't get hung up on the semantics on what I'm saying. The Lord has ways of appearing to people that you know not of. Before you decide whether somebody has found the Lord or the Lord has found them before they passed, some of y'all are going to be stunned at who made it across. <laughs> But, it, but if you find the Lord in the last few minutes of your life, you don't have a space of time to accumulate good works. Listen, we're not saved for works, but we're saved unto good works. In other words, there is a crown that I get to put at his feet, but it's not a crown that I get just because I showed up. It's a crown that represents the grace of his sacrifice through my life as I walk throughout the earth, that is my reward, and it's also his reward. But there are those who don't yet know Christ who are accumulating a reward in heaven. Come on, don't let don't go don't go tilt on me. They're accumulating a reward in eternity, even though they don't yet have their ticket punched. Think about that. think about that that's good news it's good news no matter for all of us or for some of us who came later to the game remember 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 the parable 
of the vineyard workers. The ones who were hired at the beginning of the day, working the full day, and the ones who showed up at the very last minute. They all got paid the same. And when the ones who had worked the entire day complained about it, his response was, isn't it mine to do what I want with? Yeah, and you agreed to it. Why are you mad? Because I'm so generous. My paraphrase. It was mine to do as I saw fit. That's good news. Listen, there's some people you know, and for those of us who are still waiting for somebody to figure it out, listen, listen, listen. The Lord knows where the opening in their heart is, and you can take comfort in that. And he also sees ahead and he makes provision. He's the master at the long game. We don't even think in terms of a long game the majority of the time. I believe we're at a space in time where the Lord wants us to be aware of the person of peace. There are many among us that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that the Lord is using at the end of the age. You know, and, and we've, we've got to re-examine what the scripture means when it says, don't be unequally yoked together. I know believers who are unequally yoked together because they are in the wrong station for each other. Just because you've had a salvation experience doesn't mean or just because you're, uh, you know somebody with a salvation experience doesn't mean you're supposed to walk closely with them. See, it has as much to do with the lane and the station that you're in before the Lord as it does with where you're going to spend eternity. Because I believe God is calling us to walk maybe even in proximity to those who don't yet know him, but they're called at a similar station as we are, and there's a grace on their life. Now, come on. Only church people struggle with this. Those of us who work in the secular arenas, we don't struggle with this. We've already figured this out. If you haven't, quit frustrating yourself. Look, it doesn't mean you have to go to the bar with them on Friday night, but you can still be friends with people who don't yet know the Lord. And I don't mean a friend waiting for a conversion. You know, like... Like, I have friends who don't yet know the Lord that we just hang out. I'm not trying to get them saved. In fact, some of them, I've just come to realize the Lord is actually using them in my life for something he wants to bless them with later down the road that likely will not even have anything to do with me because he's playing the long game in their life. He's, held, he's letting them establish an inheritance and something to bring to the king when they stand before him. And I can't let my narrow-sighted 36-hour theology that doesn't see beyond next week block what, what God wants to do in the life of people who have not yet come to a salvation moment. See, we live for moments, but God's in it for a lifetime. Listen, eternity is an extension of this life. There's going to be productivity. There's going to be relationships. There's going to be restoration. There's going to be reconciliation. And it's not all going to happen in the first five minutes of you stepping into eternity. See, everything in the kingdom, when, remember the scripture says, there will be no sun. Think about this. This is what it says in Revelation. There will be no, no sun in the day, for there won't be a need of light. But listen, what does the sun regulate? This is going to be a shift. Who said it? Time. The rising and the setting of sun regulates time. Listen, in eternity... The Lord has his own time. He is time. 
Now, we understand God stands outside of time, but in eternity, there's still a measurement of time. It's just not like linear, like we think on a calendar, like 10 years from now. No, there is an unfolding to an order. Listen, all of music, all of creation, everything functions according to an order that has a rhythm, right? A rhythm. And rhythm is a direct extension of timing or the concept of timing. In heaven, there is still a timing and there is a rhythm, but the rhythm flows around the Son and the Father and not the ball of light in the sky, right? So there's still going to be an appropriate completion of the things that don't get finished in this life. So for those of us who are getting older and can't stop it, Everything does not have to be crammed into this life cycle. Now, this should be one of the most liberating, not fearful. This should be one of the most liberating things we ever hear. Everything that is assigned to my life does not have to be crammed into this life cycle while I'm on the earth. See, Ephesians chapter 2 says it's for the ages to come that the Father can show His love to us. Hold on, Betty. It's for the ages to come and the manifestation of the Father's love for us that we were even created. This life is not it. Now, this life is like a it's like the first lap out the gate. And there is a race in this life. But there's more on the other side. I think the Father just wants to just bring peace to our spirits, peace to our souls. You know, as we see things beginning to pile up in this age, it can become very overwhelming, very discouraging. And it's, it, it is unnerving. But I'm telling you, when you came into the kingdom, which all of you here hearing me should apply to, when you came into the kingdom, you shifted off of the world's time. Listen, you shifted off of the world's time. And you are already moving according to the rhythm of heaven. You are already moving according to the times and seasons of the Father of which He is firmly in control of. Let's all stand up. I know I threw a lot of historical stuff and things that we could go back and camp out you know months giving better articulation and understanding of concepts and a lot of things that could be misunderstood and things that we only heard half of and there's more to hear 
But I think the thing the Lord wants us to zero in on today is that he's got this. Look, the same father who was calling the shots when this thing started is the one who saw the end from the beginning and he's bringing it not just to a close but to a completion a full circle completion the things that shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch that have been launched into the world are now coming to a full scale completion in the earth Lord, I just thank you that every person right now, just close your eyes and just let the Father infuse his peace into your heart. Let him infuse his peace, the assurance that he holds all things in his hand. He's got it all. Your future, your past, your accomplishments, your absolute abject failures, mistakes you've made, every bit of it, he's got it. And somehow in him, he works all things together for good. Not just in this life, but for the full manifestation in the age that is to come. It's in the age that is to come that we will step into the fullness of the manifestation of what the Father had in mind. And Lord, that your people would not get distracted or falsely attracted. It's two different things, distraction and false attraction to the things of this world and the things that are taking place as if it was the big picture and the ultimate outcome. Because the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord will never pass away lord i thank you that this is the bedrock that our faith is built upon in this hour that we are a people who cannot and will not be shaken because our roots go deep into you we're not hanging our hat on a political party affiliation, dear God. We're not hanging our hat on the price of gas currently. Thank you, Jesus. We are not concerned about shortages of food supplies. For you have seen ahead, you have promised. Look at how your father closed the birds and the flowers. Will not he do more for you? And Lord, I thank you that you are making us aware in all of our lives of the people of peace. I just say there's a freedom to love people like you have never experienced before to not disqualify them for their language, for their dress, their social status, but we begin to let the love of God flow from us in a way that we have not because there are people that you have already identified who are gonna become laborers and co-laborers with you at the end of the age that don't even yet know you. And finally, Lord, like Isaiah, if you're still looking for somebody to go, if you're still looking for somebody to carry a message that needs to be said, Lord, don't look any further because I'm right here. Send me, Lord. Whatever needs to be done in these final closing moments, send me. I'm here and I'm ready to do the thing, to stand in the place. Whatever final moments are left, Lord, I am ready. Send me.
Lord, we all yearn with a sense of purpose that is only fulfilled in you. It is the fire that is shut up in our bones. And no matter what has brought us to this point, Father, allow us to be ignited and burn for you. And whatever remains of this age and whatever remains of our lives, I just believe the Lord is saying to many of our hearts today, and this is my, my closing statement. Some of you have decided that you've missed your moment. And I feel like the Father is saying, let me back in. I'm not talking about where you'll spend eternity. Let me back in and let me complete the thing I've started as long as you have breath as long as you have breath finish the work thank you Jesus you know just take a moment and just kind of have a Selah with the Lord to stop and think about it. Lord, I just ponder before you what you've been saying today and the words you've spoken prophetically and even in the worship song that Judah team was singing earlier. Lord, what you're saying about me. Just allow your heart to trace all those things. The word that Anita gave about prosperity and how the Lord is bringing everything full circle in a season. And allow your heart just to say, Lord, I agree. I agree. I agree with your word. So be it, Lord. So be it, come on. Put your amen to the word of the Lord. So be it. So be it. I agree. There's power, come on, there's power in that. So that we're not forgetful hearers. What did you hear today? What did the Lord say? What, when did you feel that shift? Come on, lock into that right now. There were moments in this service where you felt that shift. You went, ah, yeah. Go back and grab that right now. That moment where you felt, that's for me. Grab it. Hold it. Yes. So be it. So be it, Lord. Be it unto me, Lord, even as you've spoken. I am the handmaiden. I am the servant of the Lord. Be it unto me, even as you have spoken it. Yes and amen. Now just lift your hands right now and just receive. Just receive. Father, we thank you for your blessing upon us. We thank you for your smile upon us. We thank you for your provision. We are not like those who don't know God who worry. He said, if I so fed even the lilies of the field, so will I take care of you. That was a word of the Lord that Anita spoke earlier. Come on, we're not going there. We're not driven and tossed by that wave. We say yes and amen. 
Thank you, Lord. Now, the Spirit of God is just affirming your heart right now. Just take that anointing coming on you. Breathe it in. Say shalom. Shalom. Thank you, Lord. Now, we bless you as you leave today. Be sure and greet someone. If you haven't met someone around you, just say hello and give them a good a good squeeze in Jesus' name. We look forward to seeing you next week. And those who've been visiting, thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. We love you. Have a beautiful day and a beautiful week. Amen.